Well, hello there, friends, and welcome once again to the 360 Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Brahim, and I'm excited about today's conversation with a friend and client of mine from Southern California by the name of Eric Bible. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Eric and what is in store for you in this conversation as a man who I admire greatly and uh, look up to in many ways. He, he would probably find that to be surprising for me to say, but I really look up to him because he has a mastery of mindset uh, that is really admirable and one that I aspire to have. Um, and I'm going to really talk with him a lot about how he has mastered staying positive, especially in the face of what was a difficult market in 2022, at least the second half and the first half of 2023. So we're going to go into depth on that, but a little bit of background on Eric. He was in the insurance business uh, prior to being in the mortgage business. Uh, and, and he learned through that business how to explain complex situations. And we're going to talk a little bit about that gift that he has and, and what he utilizes. I'm going to have him make some suggestions as to how to present information in a way that is digestible for clients and real estate agents. He is also a master at social media marketing. His website is absolutely fantastic. It's hilarious. Um, he's a very funny guy and does some really cool, funny videos. Uh, he started in the business in 2015, uh, and he was fortunate enough to work on the team of Danny Haranyi, who was one of the top originators in the United States. So he got a really great head start uh, by being under Danny's wing, so to speak. And then when Danny stopped originating, Eric took over uh, running Danny's business, which was a which was a really nice gift. And, and he has really taken full advantage of that. So uh, before we get to my conversation with Eric, I just want to remind you that this show thrives on your likes, your forwards, your subscriptions, all that shit. Like if you can do me a favor, please, as you've heard me say before, please subscribe to the show on whatever channel it is that you are choosing to view this on. Uh, and if you like this episode, please forward it to somebody else who you think would va you know, find value from it. Um, please make comments. I mean, these are all the things that get our subscribership base up. And as it goes up, as I've said many times before, it allows me to have the ability to go out and get some outstanding guests for you and to, to, to pay it back to you uh, in spades. Um, don't forget that many of the podcast episodes have a post coaching component to it from me. Click on the link below uh, in the show notes and you can find access to the post coaching uh, segments that are available to you. And without further ado, my conversation with Eric Bible. Eric Bible, what's happening, brother? What's going on, Tim? Thanks so much for having me here. It's a, a true honor and a pleasure. Well, hey, man, the pleasure is mine. I'm so proud of you. Like, uh, you're definitely one of the people that I look to. Uh, as I said in the intro, I, I look to you both from a perspective of pride in what you're accomplishing right now as an originator. And I look to you actually as a mentor, uh, which you may find that to be uh, surprising. I don't know. Maybe you don't. Um, just in the way that you've mastered mindset. And I really want to talk about how positive you are. I want to start by saying, man, that, and I don't know if I've ever said this to you before, but you are truly one of the most grateful people that I've ever met. Um, and it really lights me up, bro, when you express gratitude. Um, there's that whole component that, you know, I've read about and talked about, about how when you give when you express gratitude, uh, both parties win because there's a dopamine hit that both parties experience that in it. And I, I most definitely experienced that in my relationship with you. So uh, thank you for that very much. Oh, Tim, man, that, um, that truly warms my heart. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't, well, I'm kind of at a loss for words. I mean, it's, truly humbling and i am incredibly grateful for for those kind words but it really comes back to you know what you know this group especially you and the, you know the, the wonderful people within the community have poured into me uh it has really enabled me to just really tr find my calling and be kind of the, the most effective operator and in turn I, you know I, I feel as if i have so much to give back because i've been given so much so yeah, man, I've got goosebumps. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's let's just go right there and start giving back right now, you and I together, and hopefully the 
the viewers and listeners will be able to take some notes and learn some great things today. So I already in the uh, in the introduction talked about the fact that you were in the insurance business and that helped you learn a little bit about um, how to explain complex situations. Uh, then you were fortunate enough to start working with Danny uh, back in, I believe it was 2015, and learned a lot from him. And then eventually, uh, when he segued out of originating, you took over um, his book of business in many ways and have been able to really leverage that and and do some really wonderful things with it. Um, we're here in, in the spring of 2023. This will be airing in the summer of 2023. Uh, uh, it's been a an, it's been a hell of a year, right? Like the last 12 months have uh, gone from feast to famine and and hopefully now back to at least eating some appetizers. Uh, and and I know that your business is starting to grow. So just just tell us real quick. I mean, um, what what were a couple of your best years in terms of units and volume, just so the listeners could have an understanding and perspective. Absolutely. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I mean, as you mentioned, had wonderful mentorship under Danny Harani and really learn uh, the trade. And I would say some of my breakout years, 2019 did uh, helped over 220 families for 120 million. 2020, as we all know, was just a, a standout year. Refi boom, still focused predominantly on purchase, uh, exceeded 150 million. And then 2022, um, was able to, despite the turbulence in market, served over 90 families uh, for 65 million, uh, which was, you know, exceeded our expectations just given the volatility in market. You know, it's what I, I don't think I ever put this together. Uh, I don't know that I know of any originator, and I know a lot of originators over the course of my career that have gone. Uh, that have eclipsed a hundred million in production in their fourth and fifth years in the business. That's really incredible. Um, and for anybody who's saying, well, yeah, but I mean, he inherited Danny's database. That doesn't matter because the reality of it is, is that the art form of being able to do over a hundred million in production and over, you know, 200 and plus units is, is to be able to, to really efficiently run all of that, to organize that, to have a team, to have systems, to um, and to convert those people. I mean, so congratulations, and that's Thank a you. really great start. You're welcome. So <clears throat> let's just go right for the kill shot, um, and then we'll we'll backfill with social media marketing and you know uh, other strategies that you do. Your your amazing website that I want to talk about that I love so much because it makes me laugh and. I was watching an Instagram. I was watching an Instagram reel of yours yesterday where you have that. What is that thing that you wear over your shoulders when you're reading oh. a story? I mean, <clears throat> it's it's a it's actually a bath towel, but it's supposed to look like a, a scarf. And it's the the mortgage term of the week. And it, yeah, we, we've had a ton of fun with that. I love how much fun you have in creating this stuff, man. It just it makes me smile and and, and I think there there's a lot to benefit from that. We're gonna go there in a bit, but I want to talk about uh, I think December ish of 2022. Uh, I want to start right there. And I want you to share with us where you were mentally and emotionally, say in October, November, when things got scary. Um, and what you did to shift and what the results were, especially in January of 2023, when everybody was really struggling. I mean, I was talking to people who are used to doing 30 deals a month in my coaching sessions, and they're like, I'm going to fund five this month. And then there's Eric Bible, who's having this explosive month. Um, and before we go there, actually, I want to tee that up a little bit <clears throat> by reflecting on our our retreat in Malibu that we had in, in spring of 2022, when you and Sosi uh, we're, we're very vulnerable and expressed to the group, three of us coaches and the other 10 people in the group that, you know, you were, you were concerned because you had never seen this before and things were really starting to slow down and you weren't quite sure what to do. You didn't know whether or not ethically you should be, you know, creating a pie in the sky type component with pre-approved buyers and, selling fear and scarcity and trying to convince them to write offers on homes when you're in your heart, which said a lot about both of you, you weren't feeling it. You were feeling that property values had peaked um, and that you were, you were really conflicted internally on whether or not giving advice to people to move forward and writing an offer was truly the right advice. And 
Uh, I really admired that about both of you. And, you know, as you remember, I gave you some coaching on that based upon my experience. Um, and then we fast forward to October, November, and sure enough, the shit hit the fan and, and things had slowed down a lot and property values had started to drop. Um, so take us there into the, the fall of 2022 and, and what started to happen. Definitely. And, you know, it, I look back on the time in Malibu uh, and the insight you provided myself and Sosi, and, and it was really a turning point in my career as originator. Um, I had unmasked, as you had mentioned, a tremendous amount of success in a very short period of time and really never experienced adversity up to that point in this business. And looking back at, you know, what was shared in Malibu around, you know, providing advice, leading from the heart, it clicked something internally. And I knew at that point, whatever was presented with market factors or outside forces, I was going to be okay. And I was going to be uh, really pivot to becoming an advisor as opposed to just an originator. So it took some time for that to click uh, and really leading into, as you mentioned, when, when the shit really hit the fan in late September, early October, and through the close of the year, there was a uh, something that clicked internally and it was, yes, property values were starting to decline, but simultaneously we saw inventory falling off a cliff. And the fact that all the teachings from Barry, yourself, others in the in the, the community around, we still had an increase and still have an increasing population, which is demand. There are not enough homes for sale. So where yes, naturally home prices had to soften just given how fast mortgage rates rose, that softening was due to the fact that people were not taking action. So as soon as I really, that piece of the puzzle clicked, I led into it of, okay, one, gain footing, get calm, and let's really start addressing the concern with our clients using the data that we have to accurately advise where we see the market going from here. And I made a conscious decision at that point when everyone was running for the hills, it was time to hammer down and pick up the phone and really be the differentiator in mindset. Every originator I was talking to at that point was the end of the world is here. Rates are going to 10% or higher and we're all going to lose our jobs. And I, you know, I looked at this as an opportunity to kind of be the, the calm in the storm. And I found as I started getting on the phone with both our, our clients, but most importantly, our referral partners was their there was mix, mixed messaging in market, you know, to the point where ha pending housing crash rates are not going to come down. And, you know, it's 2008 all over again. And the information that was provided by, you know, our coaching community, Barry really leaned into this information and in turn cultivated, you know, a presentation that I was able to deliver at a very high level to a number of agents that were hungry for information at that point, because their clients were looking to them and they didn't have the answer. And it just created massive momentum going into the new year. Uh, and from there, while everyone was running for the hills, I mean, as you were mentioning, Tim, originators that were used to closing 30, 40, 50 units a month were looking at, you know, single digit numbers leading into the new year. We had one of our best Januaries to date um, because of the the mindset shift, but also the intentionality and in how we were showing up for our referral partners and clients in that fourth quarter made all the difference. And we're still experiencing that momentum into now, you know, the summer months. So in the fall, when you were that as your buddy Tyler Osby refers to it, at the beacon of light, when you were um, sharing with your realtor partners a presentation that was positive and optimistic, and yet at the same time true for you, which I think is a really important piece to it, is that you could inside of yourself feel that you were coming from a place of values and integrity. Um, give us just a, a little bit more depth of 
What was the message? What were you saying to them when you were making these calls, when you were pounding the phones? And and before you do, you, would you fund 8 million in January or something like that? Correct. Yeah. And, and, and how are you doing right now? We're recording this in, in early May of 2023. What's your year to date fundings? Year to date fundings. We're at 26 million uh, in May. It's looking, you know, barring no fallout at this point, it's still early in the month. Uh, we're 10.1 is, mm. is what we've got locked. Um, you know, assuming nothing pushes into to June. So, so, we'll th be... so through May, we're going to be in the 35, 36 million range, which puts you on track for somewhere around 90 million and, and probably more because I think things are going to get better. Okay. So that's really important Definitely. data. So let's go back to that messaging in, in the fall of 2022 and into the, into the winter when everybody else was scared and didn't know what to say. What did you, what did you do from Okay, I want I want to ask two questions here. So I'm going to throw a lot at you. What did you present tactically to them? What was the message? And more important than the message, how did you shift your mindset uh, mindset out of scarcity into a positive vibe that you were um, communicating? Great question. I'll kind of lead with the second part because that sure. ultimately dovetails into the message I was delivering our referral partners. You know, I look back summer months. It, I, I undoubtedly can say I was scared. There was a point where I was feeding into the negative narrative that was out there. Woe is me. Holy bananas. This, this party is stopping and shit, what do I do? Um, so I too was kind of caught in that doom loop. Uh, and again, reflecting on the time in Malibu, there was a click with, with um, some of the mentors that I'm working with, you know, Chris Ledley, Mark Robertson, uh, and the mindset shift didn't happen overnight. It was an evolution really over probably about a, a month period where I finally came down to, you know what? I am enough and I am providing value to our clients, our referral partners, and I have something to, to give to help people in this uncertain time. I need to get this message out there. So it's definitely an evolution over, uh, like, like I said, about a month period where I had to internally kind of shift the narrative from negative to, hey, there is so much opportunity out here right now, and it's time to deliver. Uh, so that took some time. But the minute I got the mindset for myself shifted to, we are going to deliver in this market, the rest fell into place. And really the messaging that I brought forward to our referral partners was the media has definitely got this wrong. And I want to show you why and why this could be the greatest opportunity for our buyers. And that alone, given you know all the phone calls that our referral partners were fielding tail end of 22 was, you know, rates are going to be elevated. There's there's really no hope. Housing is going to crash and it's 08 all over again. You know, I provided a counter narrative with factual data. The optimism that I led with on those phone calls was incredibly well received because at that point, you know, the, the number one real our lenders were running for the hills. It was, you know, week after week, we saw another IMB or mortgage bank closing. And then here I am on the phone with referral partners and clients advocating a completely different message than what the media and what, you know, we were seeing on a day by day basis, you know, through our news feeds. So that piece alone, when I picked up the phone and it was, Hey, this is Eric Bible with Neil home loans. I, I have something that I think will benefit you as it's a counter to the current narrative that we're our, you and our clients are seeing on a day by day basis. You have a couple minutes to go through it with me over the phone. And that piece alone, it, opened up, I mean, I made, I, I think in inside the month of, uh, that was October, over 250 phone calls to uh, 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 past realtors that I had worked with. Um, at first, it didn't, it didn't feel natural. But as I got more on the phone with these individuals and really started listening and sharpening my, my, my skills with, you know, what we were able to provide, I mean, the message, the, the the response back was unbelievable. I, I mean, it truly was a, a gift to be able to provide a counter to the negativity that was just feeding all of us uh, and feeding the, the complete media narrative that 
you know, ultimately it proved true as we're seeing now. And I truly believed in what I was delivering. Um, but I look at the advice we provided in that period of time, those clients were, are set up for massive success. They beat the wave that's, that's forthcoming. Uh, and now being able to lean back onto that has been wildly beneficial as well. Yeah. I want to, I want to hammer a couple of points home here that are really important. Um, first of all, you, sharpened your skills by making so many phone calls. Um, the, the challenge that I think most originators run into is that they'll try something a couple of times and it doesn't necessarily go well. They don't get the immediate gratification of having success from it and they give up. But you kept pressing on and as a result of having so many interactions with so many past realtors in a time when they were craving for information and craving for something that would give them hope, you over time developed a presentation that was incredibly well received because you had all the practice in delivering it. I'm sure the first three phone calls were very different from the last three phone calls as it related to your energy, as it related to the way that you articulated the content, as it related to the way that you formulated and, and dialed it in, in in a sequential order to build to a crescendo of hope. Um, the question that I have is, was it truly kind of one of those fake it until you make it type scenarios? So like in, oh. in, in September, October, you're like second guessing yourself, you're buying into the negative narrative. And all of a sudden, you know, with working with Chris and Leds, uh, with Chris and, and Mark, you, you then decided, okay, I'm going to shift my mindset. I'd be curious to know how you went about shifting your mindset. Like, can you identify that? Like, what was the the way that you worked within yourself about getting yourself out of negativity and into a positive frame of mind, because that's not so easy for a lot of people. Definitely. And to your point, yes, I definitely faked it till I made it. Uh, and, and that's, you know, really uh, it's worked for me many times before and, you know, repetition yields results. Um, but to your point of mindset shift, you know, I, I'd never been coached professionally, personally, prior to joining the L360 community. So, you know, before it was, you know, positive voice creates positive reinforcement uh, and hoped that it would work uh, through your coaching, Julie, Scott, there was key points specifically around meditation. I leaned so hard into my morning routine during this time, um, journaling really positive affirmations, reading other than negative outset. I mean, clarity and connection inward, uh, the books that you've recommended that helped so much where I could start the day knowing that, okay, I, I got myself ready mentally and, uh, spiritually. So, I mean, getting up early, I, I truly, during that time, I deviated from my morning routine over the summer months, got, you know, lazy, if you want to call it, spending time with family, doing the things in summer. Uh, and then I realized that, you know, I'm not starting the day. I'm just kind of leaning into it at that point. So going back to, you know, late September, early October, I doubled down on my morning routine and that piece alone truly helped me shift out of the rut and into kind of that ab abundance mindset and really in, in, empower and, in, and invoke kind of the positive outcome that I ultimately yielded there. But it was work, man. I mean, it was not easy. Waking up at, you know, 4.45 uh, during the week is freaking brutal. But the clarity that I was able to obtain, kind of the abundance, that, you know, inner voice of, of gratitude through that kind of work that was done up front truly had and has had such a positive impact in how I show up on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah. That young Pueblo is something else, isn't he? Amazing. Oh my goodness gracious. Unbelievable. I mean, that guy's been a part of my, uh, my morning routine now for three years. Um, for those that don't know what the hell Eric and I are talking about, there's a brilliant young man. He's only in his early 30s. Name, his pen name is Young Pueblo, Y-U-N-G, and then P-U-E-B-L-O. And he's written two absolutely fabulous books, um, Inward, and then his second book is uh, Clarity and Connection. And um, these are books that are perfect for a morning routine because they're meant to be read one 
page at a time. And sometimes that page only contains 10 to 15 words, but they're incredibly meaningful. Um, it's so fascinating, right? Like in, in times of crisis, and I mean, when you look at things through the lens of say, Dr. Joe Dispenza's teaching, which, you know, I've shared m much of his teaching with, with all of you, um, we have to understand the hormones of stress, right? So in, in this time of incredible negativity, when the world seems to be coming to an end um, and we are afraid, we are then uh, operating under some very powerful hormones within our body, um, adrenaline, cortisol, among, among many. And those chemicals cause our focus to become very narrowed. We get into a fight or flight component um, we seek to find solutions to very, um, in a very myopic way to a very tunnel visioned problem. We, we are incapable under those hormones of seeing opportunity, being creative, being expansive. Um, and as a result of that, we can really forget about the importance of doing our work. And um, we just get locked into waking up every morning and trying to fight our way through the problem rather than saying, whoa, 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 let's slow down. Let's start the day right. Let's double down. I, I remember having a conversation with Leds about this um, many months ago now about doubling down on his morning routine, which he did. And he, he had just tremendous results. And I was doing the same. I was worried as well, just as for me, it was like a it's, it's been a very interesting year for me in that regard, bro, in the sense that, you know, I was worried about my business and worried about my team, um, you know, because if you guys are struggling, it's going to have a direct impact on on us. But equal, if not more potently, I was worried about all of you because I love you guys and we're so close and seeing you struggle and coaching all of you so much in the last year and most of the conversations being conversations with people who are in fight or flight. It was mentally exhausting to me. And I realized at some point, I'm like, this is wearing me out and I need to start taking really good care of myself right now. Now is the time to really start getting up earlier. I did too, man. I'm used to getting up at like 6.30 or something, but I started getting up at 5, 5.30, really putting in the extra time in my meditation practice and my journaling, reading Young Pueblo, um, starting the day in, in a positive mindset. Um, and it's really incredible how at the time that we need it the most is when we abort. And if we can be awake to the fact that, oh, wow, I'm aborting from the things that are so incredibly important and then find ourselves and anchor back into that, it can be such a massive springboard. And it's such a testament. I mean, you are such a testament to that uh, because I saw that shift. And I, I mean, you were one of the few we had that coaching session, I think it was in December and, you know, it was such a powerful coaching session. That was the one that Sosi dropped in on, you know, at the end because he was getting ready to be coached by me. And um, the energy that you brought to that call, the positive mindset, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, whatever, like two weeks later, you're telling me you're going to fund 8 million in January. And I'm like, holy shit, like everybody needs to know about this. Um, and it was as a result of you doing your work and, and gosh, I can't. I can't emphasize the importance of that enough. I mean, people always, you know, wonder, you know, what is this L360 thing and why do you guys do, you know, work beyond that of just the business work? And it's clear. I mean, the interpersonal work is the business work. Absolutely. I mean, let, you know, if we go back to like the spring of, uh, of 2022 at the retreat in Malibu, I could really feel the fear in you and Sosi that day. And, yeah. and it, and it, and, and I had been there before, right? I mean, many years prior as an originator. And if you remember, I shared with you guys in that moment, I said, this is the market where real originators are made. You know, and this is where you become a true originator is the tough market. Um, and there's that really seductive temptation that creates this internal values-based conflict associated with, I, I remember we had a coaching session I don't know if you remember this, but you got on the call with me and the first thing that you said to me was, holy shit, I just experienced something that I've never seen before. And I said, what's that? And you said, there's a guy who I'm doing a loan for that I, I believe I'll probably get the numbers slightly off, but you're like, the house is listed for 2.5 million and he made an offer for 3.1. He had to, he got into a bidding war and he's buying the house for 3.1. And I could see the like, internal conflict within you because you were looking at that going, this doesn't, this isn't smart. Like this doesn't make sense. This guy's way overpaying. And the temptation from a self-serving perspective in those moments, of course, is 
to then say, okay, well, my business is starting to slow down. So I got to craft the right script to start selling fear, but that wasn't an alignment with what you were seeing and feeling. And I really admire you for not doing that and digging into the data to really be able to rectify internally within yourself what was true for you and then having your presentation and your scripting be in alignment with your truth. And I think that's such an important lesson to learn because where we get in trouble as salespeople is out of our own fear, we abort our values and start selling something different than is our truth. And um, so do you want to comment on that before we absolutely we I mean, and this comes down to, you know, twofold. One, you've ingrained in my mind the truth is the best script. And I, I feel and experience that in my heart day by day. Honesty is is the best way to convey value. But also to that point, tough waters are, are smooth waters have never made great sailors. It's it's in the turbulent times where the true craft and skill is is cultivated. So here, I mean, what we've experienced over the last year, what I've experienced over the last year, to your point, has has honestly made me the best originator. Uh, and I'm grateful for it where, yes, it's been incredibly painful not having gone through this. Um, it, it would have been smooth sailing and, you know, no, nothing is gained when they're smooth sailing. So I, I feel on the other side of this and we're, we're near the end, I believe we're seeing it. Um, the skill set that I've unmasked through this time this will shape my career and my life my client's life my referral partner's life uh for many years to come so i'm incredibly grateful for what we've gone through yeah you know it, and and here's the other benefit that few understand until they go through it is that and and i go back to when i was on my honeymoon with liz in the fall and i had a panic attack in late september when i made the mistake of checking the financial markets and 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 i i was worried about what was about to come and this was like mid september late september of 2022 it wasn't there yet it hadn't really all fallen apart if you remember like july oh, yeah. and august july and august were actually really good months of 2022 we had that, that yeah. dip in rates and and it and it re-spiked the purchase market and everybody's pipelines were fat because they were going to be funding loans in september and i, I had texted scott and julie and i said these guys and gals are in trouble. And they're like, what are you talking about? We're coaching them every day. Everybody's fine. They've got, they're having good funding months. I'm like, no, no, no. I was like angry. I was like, it's going to get really bad. Now, how did I know that? I knew that because I've been through it so many times, you know, the signs. So yeah. the benefit also of you having gone through this for the first time is that you're wiser now going forward. You'll see it before it happens in the future. And it will happen again because the nature of this business is cyclical but you'll, you'll be able to see it coming from a mile away and you'll be able to prepare properly for it to where it won't be as challenging and scary for you in the future because you'll, you'll be able to uh, adjust accordingly. Um, I want to uh, let's, before we move to some tactical stuff and, and get into some social media marketing stuff, et cetera, you mentioned gratitude. I mean, you've mentioned it a couple of times. What's your gratitude practice? I mean, it, it really strikes me that you do such an outstanding job of practicing gratitude in whatever way you do. And, and before you answer that, what I experience in you, bro, is not just the words. Like you, you like gratitude is not like checking the box of saying something in the mirror, writing three things down every morning in your journal. It's about feeling the gratitude. And what I experience in you is you actually feel it. Like I can, when you express gratitude, I can feel your gratitude. Do you have any wisdom to share with people about, about your practice in that regard? Absolutely. And, and, you know, for me, to your point, Tim, it is when someone expresses gratitude to me, it, it fills my heart. And in turn, you know, I want to express that energy to that person in the same manner. So it take your head out of the equation. I mean, your head will will always cultivate whatever response is necessary, but really you have to feel the gratification in order to express gratitude. And, and you know, my practice of gratitude, it's been an evolution, but in the morning, my, my meditation is around 
I don't listen to anything anymore. It is truly sitting in a quiet space and feeling the energy of the room. Uh, as corny as that sounds, but it, it really gets my day started properly so I can really feel and experience all that's around. And, and really when you know someone brings something to me or I bring something to them, whatever, whether it be wisdom or a gift, whatever it may be, it's I want to experience that from, a, from an emotional standpoint. And in turn, I want to pass that back to the individual uh, that provided that gift to me. So it really comes down to you know heartfelt expression. Um, and that's something that you guys have really helped me cultivate so strongly is, you know, the heart is going to lead you in directions that the mind never could unmask. And, and I really want to follow that, give that gift to my children, my wife, uh, as much as humanly possible. Yeah, you know, what I'm aware of when you share that is, uh, again, back to Dispenza, uh, uh, he has so many amazing phrases that I um, that I really revere. And one of them is where you put your attention is where you put your energy. And it's so true. So if your attention is on the outside world, then your energy is on the outside world. And in most cases, in many cases, your energy is on things that are negative. If you put your attention in the center of your chest and you allow yourself to really feel the magnitude of the love that you have in your heart, and then maybe bring some people and or experiences into that heart center and allow yourself to feel how grateful you are um, that's that's when the emotions of gratitude start to really get evoked and that's where it can become truly a superpower in shifting your mindset and your focus um, because there is a dynamic synchronization between heart and head head left to its own devices is going to go to a lot of places that aren't serving yeah. Heart will always go to places that are beautiful and serving. And then when you can go from there up into your head, now you have an entirely different thought process that's being evoked because the heart's driving the thoughts. Um, I really love how how you practice that. It doesn't sound corny to me at all that you feel the energy of the room. That's what meditation's about. So um, I think it's beautiful that you're continuing to do your work and cultivating that practice. So um, in, Absolutely. in segueing a little bit, we're here again in the spring of 2023. Uh, what are a couple of the things that you're doing right now, practical business disciplines that you are finding to be valuable and successful that you'd like to share with those that are listening? Absolutely. And, and where no denying it is still challenging. It requires massive intention, massive effort. We're still unmasking solid success. And there is so much opportunity in this market. It just depends on where you look at it and the mindset that you lead into it. And what we're finding tremendous success with is around buyers that decided to pause over the last few years. So really what we've brought to our referral partners uh, and new referral partners, we want the people that said no last year. Introduce us to those people and allow us to show why now is still a phenomenal time to buy. Contrarian to, you know, the media belief, you know, we've now seen CoreLogic post two consecutive months of home price appreciation, home price increases, and it's looking, the data is set up to where we're going to see another run in values, the fact that inventory is so low. So allowing the client that said, hey, I have to pause last year because rates have run away, Home prices are, we feel they're going to come down. Let me show them through data that that is the, the incorrect belief. We've unmasked a tremendous amount of success there, and it's opened new doors to referral partners that we did not have a relationship with before. The other piece of the puzzle, which is, is starting to really gain traction, is around the move-up buyer. We know inventory is is suppressed and majority of that inventory suppression is around the fact that buyers or sellers I, I should say are feeling trapped because they're sitting on an on an interest rate that is below the current rate of interest you know right now what 80 percent of all homeowners that have indebtedness tied to the property somewhere between four and three percent possibly even in the twos so as a seller looking at okay home prices are higher you know, my value, yes, it's gone up, but my payment is, you know, $2,500 a month. If I'm going to move up, it's going to go up, you know, two, three, four grand. Why am I going to move right now? 
So what we're really leaning into is the move up strategy. So cultivating our, our past client database, individuals that purchased between 2018, 2021, that potentially harbor some sort of regret or need to move out of the current home. Another piece that we're bringing now to our referral partners is creating inventory in an elevated rate environment. And it's again, centered around this concept of people want to move, but are not of the correct mindset because they're trapped in fear that interest rates will not allow them to move. Uh, so we've really leaned into this and, and through this evolution, I would say over the last month since, since our time in Austin, Tim, uh, consumer debt is at an all-time high and equity in individuals' homes is near an all-time high as well. What we've found more success in is identifying the pain point of why the individual needs to move, but also through that point, instead of taking all the down payment or all the equity in the existing home, using some of that to pay off consumer debt and still allowing the individual to move up. We just closed for a client on Monday. They went from a 2.875 rate to a 6.375, went up in price point $400,000, at face value, their payment on mortgage alone went up 3,200 bucks. At first, the initial conversation was, Eric, that is way too much. I can't do that. That doesn't mathematically make sense. They had $375,000 in equity in their home, and we're sitting on over 100,000 in consumer debt. When we shifted down payment away from the new home into payoff of consumer debt and front-loaded their child's 529 plan, their blended household debt ratio went below their current mortgage payment. We ended up saving them money because we paid off all of their consumer debt, prepared their kids for college, and got them the two extra bedrooms that they were dying for. And in turn, this created three additional sides for the referral partner that were not there before. Because the, the two down legs that were after the client selling, buying, and then the two clients that purchase thereafter. So this concept that I don't want to move because the rates are too high, you're approaching the conversation with not the right optics. The fact that consumer debt is where it is, if we can allow the consumer or the, the buyer to pay off that debt and uncover the true need of what their, their household requires, we're in it to win it. And that's truly the advisor role that, that we're taking on right now. So we could probably just stop the recording right now and everybody just got something so valuable that this listen would be well worth it just right there. I want to provide a little color commentary around some of the things that you said, but wow, bro, that was really, really powerful. So Number one, the first thing that I want to say is thank you. And the reason that I want to say thank you, in addition to the fact that you just taught something incredibly powerful in this episode, is that from my perspective, as a teacher and as a coach, my job is only really ultimately gratifying to me from a selfish perspective if people implement the things that we teach and that we help try to help them with. So thank you for making me feel so good because this is something that we talked about in Austin. Thank you for being an implementer of these important concepts. You took it actually to an entirely different level, by the way, that I had not even thought of, which is creating a move up buyer opportunity by understanding, because the key thing, like as we talked about in Austin at the retreat is you got to know the data. You have to know what is going on in this person's world. If you don't have the data, you can't advise them to make intelligent choices. You're leaving them as a novice to their own devices. They look at the lens of 2.875 versus 6.375 and they're like, doesn't make any sense. Okay, but that's not all the data. There's $100,000 in revolving credit card debt that is in play here that is important information. And that is a brilliant strategy to have them take some of that equity, pay the credit card debt off. You still have got your you know, 20%, 15%, whatever it is, buy up, get the house that you want and actually reduce your 
payment load. Now, that's the part that I really want to focus on for a minute. Right now is not the time to be selling rate. And that's the challenge that most originators have not worked their way through yet. Refine booms create lazy salespeople because you get very complacent. You sell 30 year fixed rate, 15 year fixed rate, and you sell rate. Why? Because that's the sell at that time. But then the market shifts. And if you're not nimble and you're not malleable and you don't understand that there's a new sell here, and sometimes the new sell is payment, which is what the sell is right now. Okay. It's not rate, it's payment, which encompasses all of your consumer debt, maybe even your auto loan as well. And then there's other markets and this will happen too, bro. And I'm going to give you the heads up before it happens. Cause I'll be watching it closely and I'll be pinging everybody in the WhatsApp threads when it's time. Just like I told everybody a year ago, two, one buy downs and half the people didn't even know what they were. And then, you know, three, four months ago, I'm like, it's not rate, it's payment. And soon it's going to be yield curves, no longer inverted. The sell is a fixed rate loan at three and a half. It happens to be fixed for 60 months or 84 months, and you'll explain that to them when you take them through the analysis, but you also are going to be explaining to them, and I'm sure that you did in the case of this six and three eighths percent person that you're referring to that just funded, that you're not going to have the six and three eighths percent for very long, because I'm going to watch this for you and I'm going to get you out of it. And probably by the end of the year, you're going to be in the mid to low fives, because that's yep. the reality of it. But you can't confidently come from this place. You can't present from this place, if you're not a student of your craft, if you don't know the data on the client and you don't understand the financial markets and how they work, and you're absolutely right, you know, we're, we're much closer to the end than we are the beginning. In fact, we may actually even be at the peak right now of interest rates heading down rather significantly. So selling payment, not selling rate, uh, important footnote. Um, I, I love something else you said. So you call to, I want to connect some dots here for everybody that I picked up on. So you call 250 people, real estate agents, ones that you've done business with before. Maybe you haven't done a deal with them in two years. Okay. Doesn't matter. They still know your name. You have an entry point, which is, Hey, we closed a loan 19 months ago. And I wanted to talk with you about something that I think is very important right now that could be helpful to you. Okay. You've got my attention because right now, things suck and I really need some positive mojo. You deliver a, a really great presentation to them. And then you say to them, which is the next piece, which is like, I want to talk to anybody that you have as a potential buyer that decided to sit on the sidelines over the last 18 months. Now, footnote of importance is get over yourself that they didn't refer those buyers to you and they referred them to other loan, other loan officer. It doesn't matter. Now it's time to swipe people away from the other loan officer. Secondly is half the loan officers have not more are not even in the business anymore. Okay. So nobody's actually servicing that client and staying in touch with them. Great entry point for you to present to them a positive strategy that helps them see strategically why right now I need Eric Bible to help me grow my business because I have too many people sitting on the sidelines and yes, and we both know, and no disrespect, but realtors don't have a tremendous amount of loyalty. So let's take advantage of that as well. They're not going to turn around and go tell their loan originator who should be delivering this presentation. Hey, you should be saying this to those eight people I referred to you to in the last year that haven't bought. They're going to just easily hand over the phone numbers to you. And now you're adopting prospective new clients and helping them move into a buying position. Um, and then the final thing is the creation of inventory piece. I mean, what was the phrase again that you said? I think I wrote it down, creating inventory in a high interest rate environment. Wow. What a powerful and catchy presentation phrase. What are the common denominators of top originators in the mortgage business? They're well scripted. They have a system for marketing themselves. that generates leads. They manage an effective database and they have strong referral partner relationships. The other common denominator of many great originators is that they have a business and life plan, a roadmap, a guide for them to achieve success. And they have an ally, a coach who assists them in the successful implementation of that plan. Performance experts, performance accelerator, private one-on-one, -on -one, one year coaching program 
is now accepting applications. This is my company and these are my certified coaches that specialize in the mortgage business. Go to www.mortgagecoachingnow.com and click on get a coach or go to the show notes and click on the link that's provided in this episode. Now let's get back to the show. And you're spot on, Tim. I mean, it comes down to one we've had little to no pushback. And it's, I'm not asking for your new people. I'm not asking that question until we've proven concept. And now that we've proved concept, the floodgates are open. Our lead count is showing that and confirming that. But you have to go through the pain to reap the reward. And I mean, to your point, yes, a lot of originators have left the business over the last year. And to that point, realtors, referral partners are feeling the pinch. There's there's little to no activity. So if we're able to deliver a message that creates action with people they've already established relationship, no new client retainment, they're not having to invest to go and grab new clients. It's people that they've already met with. We're doing all the legwork and sending the client back to them excited and ready to take action. And it, I, I mean, this concept alone has our lead count is through the roof year to date. I mean, we, we're receiving more leads than we were during the refi booms. And it's just, it's brought a new energy to the office, to our team, because people are excited. They're seeing the data and seeing, okay, the you know, media is definitely incorrect. And here's why, you know, my dad at, at the barbecue or uncle Bob isn't going to say, well, what are you doing? That's why are you doing that? No, uh, here's why. And this is why it looks good. So, you know, we're, it's been fun and it's, you know, created a lot more excitement, um, a lot more results. And, and really we feel, I feel that we're providing the best value and, and best insight right now to our clients. And it's, it's been a, a massive shift for the better. Yeah. That's a super important piece too, right? Like we kind of tend to forget who are our opposing forces that we're selling against. You are selling against dad and uncle Bob and yeah. the next door neighbor and the best friend and the work colleague who are all buying into the negative narrative. People don't want to feel stupid. Yeah, definitely. They don't, they don't want to feel like they're doing something dumb when it comes to a big financial transaction. So you need to really substantially arm them with a different narrative that is fact-based to where they can feel really confident in the choice that they're making and not have themselves talked out of it by somebody who actually doesn't really know anything, who just thinks that they know a lot and, and has some influence over that person. Um, what about, let's, I want to spend a little more time on the inventory piece. So creating this inventory, um, are you doing some of the things that, that have been talked about in our group as it relates to helping them get emotionally attached to a different home? Absolutely. T tell us that was all that. you, Tim. I mean, you're, that coaching session that you, me, and Sosie jumped on, um, I mean, leading into Austin, shifted the mindset. And, and that is really where we have seen, I have seen and experienced now the true move of the needle, getting the client, and to your point, getting the prospective buyer or seller emotionally attached to their dream home. As we all know, the current home we're in is not our dream home. There's always something wrong with it. There's always something better. And knowing that the data supports people were FOMO buying, you know, through 18, through 21, low interest rate. I mean, the list goes on and on. If we can really hammer down what the next property looks like and what is truly needed and then reverse engineer into the numbers, that's where the hook is set. And that's where we're gaining massive traction, excitement, Eric, are we there yet? Hey, I saw this house. Does this align with our payment goals? I mean, it is creating massive momentum. And if they're not buying right now because, hey, the math doesn't work in their favor because rates are too elevated, what we talked through in Austin and leading into Austin, creating strike prices for future buyer opportunities. I mean, I've got a list going here now of 26 clients that are ready and willing when rates come down another half percent. Ready, so ready and willing to sell. Ready and willing to sell. 
Yep. Man, the strike price is such a key thing. Let's make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about here. So, you know, right now you need to be calling everybody in your database, just disciplining yourself to doing it and finding out who actually really would like to own another home, but they're on hold because the rate disparity is too big. And then crunching the numbers with them and identifying the strike rate, what that rate would need to be at for them to take action and building up this massive war chest and bro, it's going to happen. In fact, when it does, I'm going to text you one morning, you're going to text from me right in the middle of one of your meditations. And I'm going to be like, it's fucking on dude. <laughs> we just dropped down to five and a half, get ready to call those 14 people in your database that you've lined up that all said, Hey, five and a half is my magic number. And then to call six realtors that day and go, Hey, I got a referral for you. Hey, I got a referral for you. Another person that wants to list their house. I mean, that's, that's what a real loan officer does. This is what I was, I got, just got the chills right now. It gets me really excited because when back in the day when I was originating loans at a high level, Stephen Marshall and I used to have these types of conversations all the time. He was a phenomenal originator and super smart and thought out of the box like I did. And in these types of environments, we would sit there and talk about, you know, like, okay, what? what's the strategy? What's the sell? What do we need to be doing right now to set ourselves up for when rates get better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when it happened and everybody else had their hands in their pocket and we're trying to figure out what to do now, we were locking loans. You know, there were times where it's funny. I was, uh, when, last week I was with Jay Dacey at the UWM live event in Minnesota. I don't know if you saw that picture that I posted. Oh, yeah. And uh, Matt Ishbia was talking on stage and, and he was super bullish on 24, more than 23. He, and he, he said, look, every, he said something that I've been saying, which is every loan that you do now is, a you know, several future refis. And, and Matt said something like, you know, every loan that you do right now, you're going to get two more refis. And I looked at Jay and I said, two, I'm thinking three or four, if you're smart, because when the rate drops from six and three eighths to five and a half. Let's say if you're on it, you refi and close all those people when everybody else is just trying to figure out what they, what opportunities they have in their database, you're like funding loans. Okay. Then the rates drop again to five and you know, 5% or four and seven eighths. And you're doing those people again at four and three quarters or four and seven eighths or whatever it is. And the loan officer that wasn't prepared is still trying to work on getting the first refi and you're already on refi number two because yeah. you're organized with it. All right, man. So this has been awesome so far. So let's, let's transition to, uh, um, marketing and social media marketing. And, um, so f first of all, what's your website URL? Because we're going to have people go to that. The Bible team. And that's, uh, B I B E L dot com. And uh, that is... We'll put that in the show notes too. Go yes. ahead. Thebibleteam.com. That is uh, our staple. I direct all of our clients, all of our referral partners there. Um, most compliments we receive from the website, it's definitely different. Uh, few people are starting to pick up to the differentness of it um, because it is so unique. But that, we had a ton of fun making it and it just you know truly speaks to who i am as an originator we, we operate outside the norm we want to have fun with it yes it's mortgage no one wants to talk about mortgage but at the end of the day you know we have a message to deliver and and i believe in in what we're doing so we had a ton of fun making that and it's you know garnered a tremendous amount of result uh and pull through just having such a unique website yeah, we're going to we're going to dive into a little bit more about about that in just a second. Um and then your handle on Instagram, the Bible team as the well. Bible team. And then do you have a YouTube channel? Uh Eric Bible. Okay, the Bible team. We'll put all these in the show notes and then um Eric Bible as your YouTube. Okay, so get ready to to laugh when you when you watch some of the stuff that Eric is producing. Um, I want to, I want to understand first of all, your philosophy about this. And I have some very, um, 
I don't want to say controversial opinions because that'd be probably too strong of a word. We'll just say that I think a little bit differently about this stuff than most people do, or I have a belief structure around it that's a little different than most people. And I think you subscribe to the same belief structure as me, which is, you know, look, if you're putting out content that is similar to what everybody else is putting out, you're not standing out. That's number one. Exactly. Number two is marketing is about evoking emotion. And one of the great emotions of, uh, that, that exists is laughter and humor and, and, and fun. Um, and, and number three, uh, there is this belief out there that you're somehow cheapening yourself if you put content out there that isn't straight and stoic and quote unquote professional, which I think is bullshit. I think that the only thing that I really care about is that I'm buying brain cells. And if people are watching what I'm putting out, I'm winning, period. So I want to hear your philosophy on why you are a goofball uh, and on your on your stuff. And tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that you have out there, then people can go look for it and, and the effectiveness, what the results have been. Absolutely. And, you know, it comes down to, man, I'm a child at heart. I got three kids. Um, the things my kids watch on YouTube, uh, Instagram, I mean, you name it, it's what is this but it garners attention and that is ultimately I'm, I'm i love fun i love to have fun i like doing fun things so I, I really looked at it of one how can we gain and garner attention as you said gain brain cells but also how can we have fun doing it and you know yes we do put out educational pieces that are you know to the point delivering a message giving an update of what's happening in market we're also having a ton of fun that is creating results behind the scene. You know, you look at our website, parkour. I love the office. Office is definitely one of my favorite shows. Yeah. When Steve Carell, you know, they're, they're doing the episode parkour, parkour, jumping around the office, doing all that thing, gave me the idea for that video that we have on our website. We got a parkour guy to do a bunch of flips in downtown San Diego, had a ton of fun with it. And, you know, that mindset when I'm out in our community, I mean, I've had people come up, I have no idea who they are. They're like, oh man, we've seen you on YouTube or we've seen your Instagram or we've seen your website. This is awesome. And I'm like, well, who is this person? My kids think I'm the coolest because I'm YouTube famous, um, <laughs> which apparently is a thing. But uh, no, it's, it, you know, if you're not having fun, what is it for? You know, we obviously have to show up. We have to do good work. But if you're not having fun doing it, why are you doing it? I mean, there's no fulfillment in that. You just show up, punch a clock, and go home for the day. I want to to truly give back one to the community, but I also want to give you know to myself and enjoy what I'm doing. So there, you know, the mindset around our marketing, in social media, all of that is is centered around. Yes, we need to convey a message. We need to provide value, but let's have fun doing it. You know, and that is ultimately when you show vulnerability and you show your true passion and, and um, who you are as an individual, people respond to that. You know, if you're just standing in front of a camera, blah, 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 are you going to watch that? You have to think about what what is going to your eyes are going to focus on. And that's the same as our consumer. If you're doing fun stuff with it. People are going to enjoy it. People want to see who you really are. And, and invoke a connection that way. I mean, especially with the newer generations that are coming up that they don't pick up the phone anymore. It's all text and they Google you. They look at your Instagram. They look at your TikTok, all of those things. If you're not there and present and, and giving a, a view into who you are as an individual, you're effectively irrelevant. And I hate to say that, but that's just the reality of life. I mean, you know, I look at my wife who's not in the business Everything that she does, she doesn't pick up her phone and everything she researches before looking at the person's Instagram, social media, Googling them, finding out who they are before she makes a decision to do business with them. And that's our customer. So if you're able to show up and show your authenticity, give you know a client a preview into who you are, that's where you can make the difference. Have you seen that um, recent reel that Bowie did with Bruce Lee? <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, dude. It's so good. Uh, my quant. <laughs> yes, it is so good. Oh, I was... love the stuff that you guys are doing, man. It just makes me smile. I, I love how out of the box it is. So in these, um, oh, by the way, 
since you love the office, maybe you ought to do like a skit with like Michael Scott doing a Chris Rock routine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we we did one kind of um, jumbo loans. One of our our guys got into a uh, like a a blow up like big guy suit and yeah. uh, had kind of the the office. Um, uh, interview type where you're sitting, what, like, why does nobody like me? What, what's going on here? And uh, I had so much fun with it, but no, uh, swipe and adapt, taking a Chris Rock impression from it. Yeah, for sure. just just be careful that you don't let any F bombs slip because it probably wouldn't play too well. But yes. the, uh, they uh, got Michael Scott in trouble. Um, mm. so, so, um, <laughs> yes. um, no, I, 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 so just to, make sure that everybody understands your formula as it relates to that. Cause I think that's an important piece. So the comedic skits, uh, this is what I'm extrapolating. I, I don't know if, if this is your truth, but it would seem that the comedic skits are intended to grab the attention and to draw people in. Yeah. And then at the end, there's always a message related to what you offer as a business professional, a, a mortgage offering, a financial strategist solution, et cetera. And you, and you position yourself in all of these skits or in most of them as kind of the wise uh, savior, the sage, the guy who who has the knowledge in this funny skit. Is that correct? Is that the, is that the, the methodology? Tell us a little bit more about that. How'd you come yeah, up with that? So, and, I mean, I have a team around me, uh, one of which absolutely loves to you know, improv beyond camera that that's his knack and there, you know, he is always kind of the, the goofball, um, you know, the funny message that we're trying to convey. And then I will come in typically at the end or sometime throughout and be, you know, the why, like, wh wh why are we doing all this? Just, just give us a call. We'll, we'll help figure this out. You don't need to go through all these hoops or hurdles, whatever it may be, whatever message we're trying to convey. So we're paying credence to, you know, the, the, um, the funny aspect, but also not making it to where, you know, I'm just this freaking idiot who doesn't know what they're doing. So it's, you know, offering that candor and fun, but also having kind of the structure around where, Hey, I, I am the professional. I am the one that's going to deliver, but I also know how to have fun in the meantime. I'm not, you know, just a, a suit that isn't going to provide, you know, anything. So what do you, what, what would you say to the person who, so there's, I think there's a couple of, I think people are always looking for excuses. My, my experience could be a projection because I think I fall in this category at times, or I used to, I've become a lot more lighthearted as I've gotten older, but I find that there are people that are always looking for excuses to not let their hair down and to not be playful and silly and funny because it is vulnerable. I mean, if you do that and it doesn't go over well, then it doesn't feel so good. So from that place, they're coming up with excuses of everything from, well, that's him and I'm not that way. He's naturally funny. I'm not, or that's unprofessional and real estate agents see that crap out there with his website, with all the goofy stuff or his YouTube channel or whatever. And they're going to not take him seriously. Um, these types of things, these types of narratives, um, how, how would you counter that? What would you say to that? Get out of your own head. You, what what you're putting out there everyone already sees you know just be you have fun with it and you know yes to your point tim not everyone is you know jovial and and willing to open up or or be that type of person but find what works for you vulnerability is what everyone wants if you're polished perfect always prim and proper do you want to talk to that person probably not you need to show your the humility side, people connect greater when you make errors, when you're authentic, true, you're not perfect, you're not polished, because it humanizes you. Not every, the person watching you is not perfect. They're seeking your advice. And if you can, you know, obviously convey a clear and concise message, but also have some fun with it and show, you know, a vulnerable side of you, you know, the response, you know, we put out a blooper reel and we got more views on the blooper reel than, you know, some of the polished, perfect pieces that we put out. And that's really where my attention went of people want to see the real human side. I mean, if you want to watch, you know, scripted television, turn on TV. If you want to watch reality, you know, go to YouTube or go to you know, Instagram. People like watching people be vulnerable. And, that, and that's really where, you know, I've 
kind of taken my mindset of how we deliver our message, you know, really kind of being, yes, scripted to a point because we obviously have a message to convey, but also it, it doesn't need to be perfect. So get out of your own mindset of, well, I can't do that because of this, you know, it get your message out there. However you need to just do it because somebody else is going to it. If you're not going to, if you're not going to step into it, you're, you're leaving yourself at a disadvantage. Well, I, I mean, I think that if we take a step back from it and we look at a, a very simple formula, which is that this is step one, this is a relationship business. As you've heard me say a million times, the loan officer with the most friends wins. Okay. So what does that mean? That means the more relationships you have, almost in spite of yourself, the more successful you're going to be. L look at Sam Rosenblatt. Okay. I mean, I don't know if you know too much about his business, but the guy's a machine, a machine, a machine. I mean, you know, I mean, in a, in a bad market like this, he's doing 25 to 30 units a month. And in a good market, he's doing 60 to 70. And when you, when you really analyze Sammy's business, he loves it when I call him Sammy. So hopefully he's going to listen to this episode. When you analyze Sammy's business, Sammy is just really good about having built a lot of relationships. Um, you're going to meet Greg Kingsbury in October because he's coming back into Masters. Another guy, huge relationship guy. Mike Watson's coming back into Masters in October. Same thing. These guys have lots and lots of relationships. Holly Walter, who you know, tons of relationships. Okay, so what does it take to create relationships? Okay, let's step back from that for a minute. Let's think about all the relationships that we have in our life. Did they come from us being in our head? Did they come from us having a plan to create those relationships? Did they come from us having a strategy that we executed perfectly to create those relationships? I don't think so. No. I think the relationships that are meaningful in our life actually were as a result of there being a place and a point where there was connection. Um, maybe you were having a tough time in your life. Maybe you had a few drinks and your guard was down and you were having fun and you were jovial. Maybe you connected because you had common denominators of athleticism or the same interest of art or whatever it is, whatever your thing is. But they relationships come from connection. And where does connection come from? It doesn't come from being guarded. Definitely not. It doesn't come from being perfect. It comes from being real and it comes from having your guard down, which is what vulnerability is. So to, to really substantiate your statement, you know, you actually, when you are bravely vulnerable and are willing to be unguarded, you leave the doors wide open for connection, which is where relationships occur. So, um, yeah, uh, I highly encourage everybody obviously to go to your channels and watch, uh, the stuff that you're doing. Cause I think it's super fun and it's cool that you guys as a team are having fun with it. And I would imagine that it bonds you even closer as a team. Absolutely. Um, so how much do you spend a month? I, I mean, I know what the number was a year ago. I'm, I don't know if you've downsized that because of the market, but like how much are you spending a month on your marketing, uh, to create these videos and, and how frequently are you, are you putting stuff up there? Great question. And we've obviously scaled back just given, you know, everything that's happening right now in market. Um, we've started to ramp up into the, the, the spring and summer months. We're about one, we do a con a piece per day, uh, five days a week. We're posting something, uh, on one of our social channels, uh, big videos right now. We were typically two a month. Uh, we're now about one per month and we'll ramp into the summer to get back to two where it's, you know, a fun, really, really eye catching component. Uh, my spend on creation has scaled back to about 1200 per month. It used to be 2,500, uh, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and we will get back to that point. I see the kind of the leading indicators to be able to turn that back on at full capacity and we'll probably increase, uh, to get more frequency around what we're, we're putting together. Uh, so right now, 1200, uh, likely into what is it? Um, July, we'll probably double that. And then by end of year, should everything hold, uh, likely going to triple the spend. You have a guy, or you did have a guy that was kind of, um, on retainer for you, right? That was like the same person helping produce all these. You still have that person. He's still, um, we have moved from retainer to now just 
per piece. Uh, there are we have been discussing this individual and I likely fourth quarter barring you know market holds where we believe it will hold uh, bringing him back on to a retainer standpoint. What's your process for creating content? Um, I was talking with Bowie about this the other day uh, when we recorded his episode uh, two days ago. Um, and I had given him some advice many, many months ago now on how to, you know, gather content and how to consolidate it and create it. I'd be curious as to how you do that. Like, how do you decide? Like, I think a lot of people don't create content because they don't even know what to create. Like, they don't even know where to get started. So what's your process for for identifying content and organizing it and producing it? Great question. Um, before it was a lot of just kind of research. Uh, I held one day per week, typically Saturday mornings were my time where I would kind of go through, watch what others were doing to kind of get, kind of get the, the creative juices flowing, look outside of the industry, you know, like for instance, the Geico's, um, you know, big marketing companies um, that garner attention and use that as kind of the focus point. Um, but as of the last three months, chat GBT, uh, it, it has, as you start asking more questions, um, it guides you to what it, specific outputs. So really using that as, you know, concepts, ideas, how to kind of create reels um, or content pieces. So I'm leaning heavily on AI right now. Um, so give us but, an example of like how, how, like what would be an example of something that you type into chat relating to giving you content creation ideas? Like what would you put in there and how would you, you know, communicate with AI to then call it down into some great suggestions? Great question. So, right, I mean, right now what we're, you know, seeing in market is a, a lot around economic uncertainty, specifically with kind of the bank failures. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the leading prompts into, you know, kind of the information pieces that we're putting out is going to chat GPT concept. Please explain to me this concept as if I were a sixth grader. Oh yeah. My, the grader. Michael Regan suggestion. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, you know, consolidated ideally reels. We want them, you know, under a minute. Um, so if you're doing short form content, you, you basically want to get a script that, you know, it's probably two paragraphs in length. Get some images to overlay with that. Um, but, you know, our, our mortgage term of the week, solely leaning now on chat GBT, you know, giving complex terms to break them down inside 30 second clips. Those drop every Wednesday. And then the other pieces, you know, we've moved away from a lot of the mortgage concept, talking more about market, um, you know, what's happening in market. So using uh, AI to help create those scripts, but also outside concepts. You know, right now I'm trying to focus a lot around mindset, self-awareness, self-help, you know, really mental clarity is key in this market and really wanting to get that message out to our, our referral partners. So using uh, AI to help create these scripts, um, I've created now probably, you know, hundreds of scripts over the years. Uh, so I've got um, a Google Drive a, a Google doc that I work off of that kind of helps collect my thoughts. Uh, and then every Sunday, um, I cut content for, you know, the weeks to come. Got it. So that, yeah, that was going to be my next question. So you kind of consolidated all into like one day where you're just creating content, right. For the whole week, rather than trying to discipline yourself to doing it like every day or every other day. Right. Like, so, cause I think that that's really important because you can build momentum that way. Definitely. I mean, and now with, you know, the features, especially on TikTok, Instagram, where you could pre-program when post will drop, you can, you know, there, there was a period knowing that my marketing person was going to be out for a couple of weeks. I had a ton of travel. I mean, we cut 35 pieces of content over a span of three days and programmed all of that in to where it just methodically dropped every single day without having to do anything. I mean, I literally spent you know, four hours over a three day period, you know, four hours each day, just cutting content and getting it to this individual so they could edit and have it ready to go. Um, but that's the biggest piece is consistency. One, you have to have something consistently hit, but to your point, doing it every day. I mean, I, 
I'm very, very focused on disciplines around time, but I know I can't command, you know, filming something every single day to then get it to my marketing person to put up. I have to dedicate predetermined times where I'm not being disturbed. I can focus, give all my attention to that, cut all the videos, get all the scripts over, and then just move on to the next task. Yeah. So I, 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 I've always operated the same way. So what I'll do is uh, one of the things that Mark and I talked about was, you know, you really have to be in the mindset of being a content creator, which means being in the mindset of a content gatherer. So you have to be looking consistently for content yes. and, and then having a place to, when you find it, save it. Right. So I put it into Doist and a folder. And then as it builds up, when I get to like, you know, eight or 10 different pieces of content that I want to create, then I schedule some time in the recording studio and I create it all in one day and then turn it over to production. And it's like, okay, here you go. I mean, perfect example is this podcast, right? So I've got the Italy retreat coming up, you know, the couples retreat, the second half of June and into mid July. So I'm going to be gone for, for 22 days with Liz. Then I come back and then I'm going down to Costa Rica to my house down there for about four weeks in August. So I'm not going to be here very much this summer. So I have to create podcasts. That's my content. And I have to do it in this studio. So I got way ahead, you know, a couple of months ago and said, all right, who, who do I want to have on the show through the summer? And that will drive the reels that we create and the clips on YouTube and all that kind of stuff. And then I, I started scheduling that stuff in advance and recording them. Now we're doing this May 11th, I think it is. And you're going to air, you know, in the next month, month and a half, but I'm getting out ahead of it. And, and I think that's a really important thing to do is to, because if, you know, the world comes at you, you know, and just, it'll, it, you may have time scheduled to be in the studio and then a deal blows up and you've got to put your focus on that. So as a content creator, I think you have to be organized and very intentional and proactive with it. Um, and that's spot on, Tim. I mean, that's, you know, the biggest complaint of, well, I, I just don't have time. Like, well, you have to make time and there you have to be able to plan forward to ensure that that momentum doesn't stop. Because once it starts going, derailing it where, you know, hey, you miss a day, you don't, you know, a couple of days fall off. It, it kills the algorithm for people following you. You have to constantly have engagement to be able to garnish results. I mean, and that just comes around being able to discipline and plan um, to ensure that it's consistent. What are the common denominators of top originators in the mortgage business? They're well scripted. They have a system for marketing themselves that generates leads. They manage an effective database and they have strong referral partner relationships. The other common denominator of many great originators is that they have a business and life plan, a roadmap, a guide for them to achieve success. And they have an ally, a coach who assists them in the successful implementation of that plan. Performance Experts Performance Accelerator Private One-on-One -on -one, One-Year Coaching Program is now accepting applications. This is my company, and these are my certified coaches that specialize in the mortgage business. Go to www.mortgagecoachingnow.com and click on Get a Coach, or go to the show notes and click on the link that's provided in this episode. Now let's get back to the show. What are you working on personally right now in your life? Um, Anything noteworthy? You know, it's, it, I've got three wonderful girls um, and just really focusing in on making sure that I show up for them and that, you know, it, it's a constant evolution. There's always something pulling in multiple directions. So really being intentional of despite all the noise showing up to be, you know, the best husband, best father that I can uh, in those moments and just really giving as much attention uh, to them as possible. So really just focusing in on the time that I have with them now. My oldest is eight. Uh, and, you know, in reflection, um, that time has flown so freaking fast. And, you know, my youngest is three. Uh, I look at them each day and it reminds me that, hey, this time here is precious. So really, really focusing in on showing up and being intentional with my time with them, turning off the outside noise and giving them all that I have in those moments that we have together. How do you do that? I mean, you work from home a lot, right? 
I work from home now about three days a week, two days a week in the office, um, you know, being focused throughout the day, not wasting time. And that's what I find a lot of people, myself, I'll use me as an example. Um, I would just, I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. And then, you know, four o'clock comes in the afternoon and I've got, you know, 20 things to do. And, you know, my kids want dad uh, and I'm, Oh, hold on kids. Hold on kids. I got to, you know, return this phone call, return the phone call. So really being intentional with my time throughout the day to ensure that, Hey, here is what has to be done. Here's the time allocations for it. I know I'm going to be lobbed curveballs throughout the day, but these are the things that have to be accomplished to ensure that I can show up in the afternoon and be dad. So really it comes down to turning off the noise, focusing on the tasks at hand and getting it done before moving to the next. You know, there's a, um, a public speaker. I don't know if he's still around. I saw him at a Todd Duncan event. I want to say 1997, 1998, long time ago now. His name is Brian Tracy. And I remember him saying, at some point in time, his presentation, he said, all right, now I'm going to give you all the most important business tip that you will ever hear. And if you follow this business tip, it will make you millions of dollars and it will be the most important thing you've ever implemented. And he paused for a long time. And then he said, when you're at work, work. And it was like a mic drop moment. Because it was like, how many people are at work, but they're not working? They're goofing around, they're socializing, they're checking ESPN, they're checking whatever, you know, whatever they're looking at. Um, and and that, that just reminded me what you described there, which is that those hours that I've allocated to work, I'm, it is incumbent upon me to be highly effective and efficient in that time. So when four o'clock does roll around and it's time to transition away from work into the presence of family life, you have a, a real good probability of being successful at it because you feel accomplished. You got a lot done. You can let go. But when you're not working, when you're at work, it really affects your ability to transition out of work later on in the day. Um, really 100%. important, important message there, bro. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad I asked that question. What a... You guys, you and Katie and the kids have any, uh, any vacations planned this summer? Yes. We're, uh, going to Grand Cayman, oh. uh, early June. We're, uh, 10 days Cannot wait. Uh, my kids are, are, uh, they have a little like calendar of paper that they made counting down the days to, uh, to vacation. So really, really looking forward to it. Yeah. I hope you can fully unplug and just be present with them that whole time. That is the plan. Is that that uh, place that has that gigantic water slide or is that? No, that's uh, um, NASA. Oh, this okay. is um, known for the seven mile beach, uh, just white, pristine beaches. So should be some fun. My yeah. wife found it and said, this is where we're going. And I said, OK, um, let's do it. Yeah, right on. Um, all right. Final question that I like to to always ask in most of my conversations. Um, if you could turn the clock back and have a conversation with your 18 year old self, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to him? Such a powerful question. Um, listen to your instincts, Eric. Plan accordingly, be prepared, but listen to your gut. If you feel like it's too good to be true, it likely is. Or, or it really is, um, but to, and take risks, uh, don't be so guarded, but really, you know, man, looking at 18 year old Eric, um, listen to your heart, follow your heart. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice that we could all learn from for sure. Um, thank you, man, for, thank you for being a friend, for being such a giving teacher in this conversation, for being um, an amazing client to coach. It's just a joy to have you as a client, bro. And, and I'm, I'm really grateful for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. And, and thank you for all that you've you know provided. You know, this last year um, especially has been, this has truly made a difference. You know, how you show up, 
how Julie and Scott show up, how the community shows up. Honestly, I don't know where I would be without the guidance of the community. And it, it truly has, has made me a better person. So thank you. You're so welcome, brother. Thank you to everybody who has tuned into this episode. I know that you got a lot of value from this conversation with Eric and uh, we'll have you back another time for sure, bro, because I know there's a lot more that we could have explored. I hope everybody you're, you're welcome, bro. I hope everybody has a wonderful day and enjoyed this episode of the 360 experience.